bailout. Nothing personal word of the day. It is Monday, May 17th. Happy birthday to my mother. Bailout. Bailout. What, what, <laughs> I went to law school and bailouts were something that we learned about. It's something when a company's in trouble, they get a bailout. You can learn that in business school. You can learn that in college. You can learn that by reading the paper. You can learn that almost anywhere. Bail is used when you commit a crime and, hey, he's out on bail. That's not a bailout. That's getting out on bail. You put down money to say, I will appear at the next hearing. I'm not going to run away because if you run away, then you lose your bail. Bailed out. A bailout is when a company, remember the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, financial institutions were getting bailed out because if you don't get bailed out, you go bankrupt. That's another word for it. A bale of hay. I made that up, actually. I think Coca, a bale of hay, maybe not a B-A-I-L. So I don't even know why I said it, so cut it out of the shop. A bailout in this case happened in baseball, and this is not sour grapes. I want to be very clear to our audience. When I told you that Albert Pujols would not be signed by another team. I said that to you on May 7th. That was a wait to see when I say something's going to happen and it doesn't, or it does. I revisit it on May 7th, 2021, when he got designated for assignment by the Los Angeles Angels. We went through in very much detail the story of why he was designated, why he did not fit with the Los Angeles Angels team, although they are and were a last place team. He wanted to start and it was an ugly divorce at the end of a 10-year, $253 million contract, which there are still years of personal services contract left to go where he gets paid a million a year for 10 years just to show up, shake hands, take photos. So he leaves Los Angeles. I said he's not going to be signed. Why do I say that? Because Albert Pujols is not the Albert Pujols of old. He is just an old Albert Pujols. He cannot start on any team. And I took him, and here's where I went wrong. I took him at his word that Albert Pujols wanted to start. And I told you there was not one team out there of the 29 remaining teams who would offer him a starting job. Okay. So that's a pretty good way to see. I feel like I got a good chance. And then I'm reading three to four teams interested in Pujols. Not a, not a problem. I think that that's just horse hockey. Then there's a little rumor that the Dodgers could be interested in Pujols. The Cardinals could be interested. The White Sox, not interested. Tony La Russa, his former manager with the Cardinals, said, I don't see a fit. So I'm feeling fine about the way to see he's going to end his career, Hall of Famer, et cetera. Dodgers, no way. They're not having a good year. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine? I'd love to have a year like they're not good year. I think they're four games over 500. People thought they'd go about 160 and two. And they're having, you know, they're behind the Padres, still behind the Giants. We're not even at Memorial Day. The Giants are still going to win the NL West. It's not even a question. However, the Dodgers would not be interested in Albert Pujols. And I forgot to consider the most important thing that Pujols was thinking about. One, I want to show Artie Moreno and the Los Angeles Angels that I can still play. Two, I'm going to hold out and see if my agent can get me into any team where I can be guaranteed to start. Three, I heard from my agent that even if a team tells you they're going to start you every game, it doesn't mean they're going to start you every game. Four, I've got kids. And I really don't want to move out of my home in Los Angeles where we've lived for all these years. So the Dodgers, man, if they take me, I would go there no matter what. It did not occur to me that the Dodgers and Andrew Friedman, who runs the Dodgers as president of baseball operations, would actually want Pujols on the team. And I knew that Andrew Friedman likes bringing in the veteran presence pieces. I knew that Andrew Friedman likes bringing in the Chase Utleys of the world, the David Freezes of the world, people to go along 
with his other young pieces at those times, but his young pieces are not as young anymore. He has Mookie Betts now. He has David Price now. He has an older Bellinger while he's hurt. He's got an older Seeger while he's hurt. An older Max Muncy. An older Justin Turner. So the reason to bring in a veteran presence for a team like the Dodgers, who is trying to repeat as champion, not become the champion, that reason is gone. Makes total sense why he did it in the past, but it totally dismissed, in my mind, him doing it again. So I'm going about my day. Everything's fine. I'm driving from Georgia to Florida, which is quite a haul, might I add. Ending up the road trip, buying razors, getting ready to shave the road trip off my face. If you're watching this on YouTube, nothing personal with David Sampson, hit subscribe and you can see that indeed I have shaved my road trip beard. Rumor comes out Dodgers could be signing Pujols, but no, I still don't want to believe it because I have an ego, of course, and I don't want to believe that I could have totally misread the market. There's no way that Pujols is going to play instead of Max Muncy. It doesn't matter that Corey Seager got hit in the hand with a hit by pitch and is going to be out, even though he doesn't need surgery, that he's going to be out for a number of weeks. It doesn't matter that there's a bunch of other injuries on the Dodgers. Because what you do is you play Gavin Lux at shortstop. You can play Chris Taylor at second base. Doesn't matter these names. It doesn't matter. You got Muncy. Albert Pujols can face some lefties, except he's not even able to hit lefties anymore or righties. He's just not able to perform the way he was. So totally dismiss it. And then I get the call from Coca. He's signing with the Dodgers. Emergency pod. No, we both agreed. It's not an emergency pod that Albert Pujols is going to sign a contract, but we're certainly going to discuss it when we get back on Monday. And I'm going to do a straight Mia culpa. I got it wrong. Now, I'm trying to think why I got it wrong. What is the level below what's being talked about out there about what the Dodgers were doing? We know the money side. The way it works is he has a $30 million contract this year. When you are released by a team, the team which releases you has to pay your entire contract, assuming that no team claims the player you've released on what's called release waivers. Release waivers, it's on your computer when you run a baseball team and you get a list every day of players who are on waivers, release waivers, and what time the waivers expire. Let's say they expire at noon on a random Thursday. That means until Thursday, you can click a button and hit claim. And of course, they confirm, are you sure you want to claim this player? Yes. If you want to claim a player, you can claim a player. But if you win that claim, that player is yours and his contract is yours. If the contract calls for a free suite, if the contract calls that you have to fly him privately to every road game, if the contract calls that his parents get tickets to every game, if the contract calls for $30 million a year, if the contract calls for a vesting option of $20 million, if he gets one double in the second inning of game 70 through 100, whatever clauses are in the contract, that's your contract. So as a baseball executive, your job is when you are about to hit the claim button, you better read the contract because every contract of every player is available in that system. So you can read the details of every provision of the contract. So people would read the Albert Pujols contract. They would see that it's $30 million. Interestingly enough, and I don't have an answer to this, Coca, because I know you're about to ask that question. The personal services part of the contract, I do have an answer. Sorry. Part of the contract that Pujols signed with Los Angeles Angels was after the 10-year deal was over, was another 13 years, $1 million a year of, quote, personal services. Does that mean that if someone would have claimed Albert Pujols, they would have had to pay him $30 million this year and a million dollars a year 
in personal services and that he would then have a personal services contract with the next team. Well, I can bet you dollars to donuts that's not how it would work because let's say he gets claimed by the, let's just say, Miami Marlins. That would mean that he'd have a 13-year personal services contract with the Marlins. No, it's a separate contract that is not part of what you are claiming when you claim the original Pujols contract. So it's pretty safe to say when you're going to claim a player, you look at the contract and you say, do I want to pay him $30 million? The only team that would ever claim Albert Pujols or any player is a team that wants to A, have that player play for them, or B, have that player not play for another team. That is why you see sometimes teams claim players who they don't actually want. A little more detail on that. I'm specifically discussing a separate topic, which is called another type of release waivers, trade waivers. Those are waivers that players go through that other teams can claim the player, but the team who put the player on waivers, once that player gets claimed, can change their mind and say, just kidding, I want that player back. Or they can say, thank you for claiming him. You may have him. Do you remember when we talk about players being traded after the trade deadline? There's a trade deadline in baseball. What that really means is that's the deadline after which you can only trade a player who has cleared waivers. If a player has not cleared waivers, that player is not eligible to be traded. The way a player clears waivers is if nobody claims the player. All 29 other teams press no thank you next to the name of the player who's on waivers. If, in fact, you choose to claim a player on trade waivers later in the season in July and August, there's two reasons you decide to do that. One is because you want the player. One is because you don't want a team in your division who you're competing with for a playoff spot to get that player. I don't know if I've ever told you the Cody Ross story. Cody Ross was a player who we put on trade waivers. I don't remember what year it was. Back in 2010 is my guess although it could have been 12, but I think it was 10. And we didn't want to pay Cody Ross the rest of his contract with us because we were trying to save money because we weren't in the race. So we put him on trade waivers. The San Francisco Giants claimed Cody, and Cody ended up a San Francisco Giant. Cody ended up having that huge home run in the playoffs off Roy Halladay. Cody ended up, I want to say, being the MVP of the LCS and then got a ring with San Francisco. The president of the Giants called and said, please don't let Cody Ross come to us. But of course, we said, we're going to let him come to you because we're not going to pay him. You claimed him. And he said to me, we only claimed him because we didn't want the Dodgers to get him and we're competing with the Dodgers. And I said, I don't care why you claimed him. We're giving him to you. And he was angry. He still talks about that as one of his most angry moments that turned out so great because of what Cody did. There's plenty of examples where that type of trade waiver claim has happened. There was one with um, the great pitcher who's still pitching, Cole Hamels. Sometimes when a team claims a player, you try to work out a trade. And the way you work out a trade for that player is you say, if you don't give me something for this player, then we're going to pull him back and you're not going to get him. Other times you say, I don't care who you trade me. We're just going to give him to you. But before trade waivers, so in this part of the major league season, which is May and April and May and June, it's called release waivers. Release waivers mean that if someone claims your player, you cannot pull him back. You've got to let that player go to that team who claims him on waivers. But again, they're claiming the full contract. And the way waivers work is that all 29 teams have an opportunity to press claim. But the claim is awarded to the team with the worst record the previous year who claimed him. In some cases, the worst record currently, but mostly it's based on previous year. 
all this is to say that nobody claimed Albert Pujols. And if nobody claims a player who you've designated for assignment, then you just release him. And when you release him, he is an unrestricted free agent. He can sign with any team he wants. And the best part about signing a released player is that you only have to pay that player the minimum salary in baseball, which is, let's just say for math, $600,000, which means the Los Angeles Angels would pay $29,400,000 to Albert Pujols and the team that would sign Albert Pujols would pay him $600,000. Of course, that money gets prorated because you make $30 million over the course of the season. Right now, let's just pretend it's June 1st. That means the season is one third over. That means there are two thirds remaining. One third of 600,000 is 200,000, which means he would be owed $400,000. Of course, Coke is telling me it's $432,000 because he was claimed on May 15th. He was signed on May 15th or whatever day he was signed. Not claimed, signed. That's a rounding error, Coca. Fine. The Dodgers say to themselves, huh, I guess we should call Albert's agent, right? And speak to Dan, and his name is Dan, and just say, Dan, would Albert want to stay home? And would he want to be a Dodger? And Dan would have said, oh my God, you're going to play him every day at first base? No, no, we didn't say that. But what we are going to do is offer him a roster spot and he'll spot start, do some pinch hitting. Dan said, well, hold on. I don't really want that for Albert because Albert told me he wants to start. I agree with you. He's not good enough to start, but he wants to start. Let me call Albert. Dan calls Albert and Albert says, hey, anyone interested? Where am I going? How's it going? Um, Nobody. There's nobody, Albert. You're not starting anywhere. Well, okay. Um, What about teams who just want to sign me? What about the Cardinals? No. What about the White Sox? No. What about the Marlins? No. Okay. Let's think of who else is in first place. Phillies? No. Mets? No. Dodgers. Dodgers? No. Dan, are you telling me that I can sign with the Dodgers and all I have to do is go public saying that I'm okay? being a pinch hitter and I'm okay playing off the bench, but can I really say that when I made such a big stink about not doing that and Joe Madden, one of the great managers in the game of a team that I loved who disrespected me by not starting me because I think I'm good enough to start, but now I'm going to sign with a team where I'm told in advance that I'm not going to start, but it's okay. You know, my legacy is going to be that people are going to say, wow, you did not have a good ending with the angels people are going to start asking you about your hall of fame cap and where you're going to go. People are going to start wondering why that happened. And you're going to have to come clean at some point, Albert, not, not about your age. You're going to have to come clean and say that you really thought you should start for the angels, but you recognize that for the Dodgers who are defending champions, that you are okay in your position off the bench. Hmm. Is that a ring grab? No, he's got rings with, with the Cardinals. Is it a money grab? No, he has the same money, whether he's some of the Dodgers or not. Is it an ego grab? No, because he has to acknowledge that he's not good enough to start anywhere. So what in the hell's going on? This is a straight F you to Artie Moreno and the Los Angeles Angels. That is the only reason Albert Pujols agreed to sign with the Dodgers and agreed to be a bench player and barely ever play is because there's only one thing that Artie Moreno hates more than losing, and that's the Dodgers. Do you know the Angels, when he bought the team, they were known as the California Angels, and then he wanted them to be known as, and then they were the Anaheim Angels when he bought them, actually. They went from California to Anaheim, and he wanted to be called the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Do you know that was their name? And when it was brought to the owners that there was going to be a name change from the Anaheim Angels to the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, do you know that many of us said that's not a good idea? Because over time, he's just going to drop the of Anaheim and you're going to have two teams called Los Angeles. Are you okay with that? I know you've got the New York Mets and the New York Yankees, but it was never anyone competing with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Do we really want the Los Angeles Angels competing with the Los Angeles Dodgers? We're not sure that that's really good for business because the Angels have not proven to, to you know, be the type of franchise with the type of history that the Los Angeles Dodgers have. 
Artie Moreno was brilliant in that case when he did it in parts. He did it in steps. He went from Anaheim to Los Angeles, Angeles of Anaheim, when we'd be in owners meetings and they would take attendance. They would do it in alphabetical order, but they wouldn't always start with the Braves, who I think are the first team. Atlanta Braves, I can't, I can't remember Coca, but let's say the Atlanta Braves, it's by city, not by last, not by the nickname, it's by the city name. And so when attendance is taken, because you can't start an owner's meeting until there's attendance and they have to write down for the minutes who's there. And so the it, Miami Marlins, Loria, Samson, Mail. So there'd be a list of people who are there and Anaheim, it actually was Anaheim Angels. They would have been first. And then you've got Arizona Diamondbacks. They would have been next. Kendrick Hall. So every name is in the record. So I'm listening to the attendance get taken one day. And there had been talk that MLB was going to allow this. And there was no vote because you don't need to vote for it. And all of a sudden, they start going. And I don't hear Anaheim. It goes starts with Arizona. And I'm thinking they made a mistake. And then all of a sudden it's Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. And I nearly fell off my chair. Of course, it then everyone, every one of us in the owners meeting was right. And we knew it, that it was going to become the Los Angeles Angels, which it is now. Do you know how much Artie Moreno cannot stand the Los Angeles Dodgers? It is worse than Yankees Mets. And that was the worst of all time before Moreno bought the team. It makes the Hatfields and McCoys look like happy neighbors. So Albert Pujols had an opportunity to do the ultimate FU to Artie Moreno and the Angels, which is not very nice, given that they gave him 240 million smackers. Anyway, Pujols is a Dodger. I got it wrong. Mia culpa. But I'll tell you one thing I'm not going to get wrong. Ready? Albert Pujols, wait to see, will not be on the playoff roster of the Los Angeles Dodgers. He may get to dress up and sit in the dugout, but he will not be on the playoff roster. You wait to see. And that's even if he makes it the whole year. And I got nothing against Pujols, folks. I really don't. Okay. We had a good weekend. Nothing personal pick of the day. Are you guys paying attention? Anyone other than Alex paying attention? I know some of you are because I keep getting tweets at David P. Sampson, direct messages, people who are happy, bunch of degenerate people making all sorts of money. I'm happy for you. We gave you three picks. Do you remember? Do you remember the fact that we're now 66 and 43 because the Wizards beat the Cavs? The line was nine. They beat him by 15 on Friday. Do you happen to remember what happened Saturday? The Bucs somehow were only favored by two points over the Heat because the Heat are playing for this. The Bucs aren't playing for that. A bunch of horse hockey. The Bucs won 122-108. That was a win. And I told you to watch Lance McCullers Jr. because while the Astros may miss Garrett Cole, they may miss Justin Verlander. They may think that Greinke was a huge part of their life. But you know what the real truth is? Lance McCullers, their best pitcher. And he was pitching against Kyle Gibson. Both have been great, but Lance McCullers went six IP, zero earned runs, and the Astros beat the Rangers. That is a sweep of the weekend. We're going to go to baseball tonight, and I want to talk about it a little bit. There is a big series happening starting tonight. It is the Twins and the White Sox. Have you noticed the White Sox are now leading the AL Central? I don't know if you have, but they are. And have you noticed that the Twins, who are my pick to win, are in last place, one of the worst records in baseball. There's something going on. There's something wrong with the Twins. Sano hit a home run this weekend, his first home run in a month. Whatever the case may be, there's just something off. The, the magic of the land of 20,000 lakes has just disappeared. When you have a series, when you are favored to win a division and you find yourself heading toward Memorial Day and you're not close to the division lead, I think they're 10 games out, and you're playing the first place team, that becomes a critical series a very critical series. The problem is who they're playing, who they're pitching tonight is that former Yankee, Jay Happ. Remember Jay Happ? Yeah, not that great. Against Dallas Keuchel, he's not the ground ball machine he used to be for the White Sox, but he's fine. 
But this series means so much more to Minnesota than it means to Chicago. The way Chicago goes into a series against the Twins right now is, hey, let's say we have a 10 game lead. Coca, I don't know what the game lead is. I guess I can look right now. 10 and a half, 12 and a half. It's 10 and a half. Okay, is it a three game series? Let's say it's a three game series. Generally, that's what they are. It could be four, but let's say it's three. Let's say we get swept. We walk out of there. We're down set. We're only up seven and a half games, seven and a half games over the twins. After having played them three times and lost three in a row, we're good. We're fine. We'll take it. If you're the twins, you say to yourself, if we win two out of three games, we got to win the series. But if we win two out of three games, we only gain a game and we're still nine and a half back. If you're the White Sox and you lose two out of three, you're nine and a half up. The Minnesota Twins in that clubhouse is they're preparing for that series. And I've been there and I've done it and it puts pressure on the players and it rarely ever works, but sometimes it does. You're talking about a sweep. And when you know you've got to sweep a series, what is the magic and only way? that you can sweep a three-game series. It's the only way. People have tried to convince me there's other ways to sweep a series, but I know there's only one way to do it. You got to win game one. Twins over the White Sox. Hap is going to beat Keuchel. The Twins need to sweep this series, and they're going to start by winning game one. When we come back, we're still watching movies on the road every day. We watch them everywhere. I watched a movie that was suggested to me by someone on Twitter in my mentions And I watched it and I watched it immediately because I had never heard of it. I can't believe I missed it. And we're also going to talk, I promise you, about a game that I am watching coming up this week in what will be the most exciting pre-playoff game, I think, in NBA history. We will be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Thank you for downloading and following and telling your friends, it's really going great. I appreciate it. You follow me through this road trip. It's coming to an end after tomorrow's show. I was here in Florida for my son's high school graduation, heading back to New York. It's been a trip for the ages. Thank you for being there along the way. Thank you for everything you do for nothing personal and keep telling your friends about it. Keep spreading the word. We do watch a movie every day. I do take your suggestions. I do put them on my phone. I keep a long list. For whatever reason, someone had tweeted at me. I think it's Ryan, but I can't remember totally, but I think it was Ryan who said, how about a movie called Fandango? It's from 1985. It's with Kevin Costner. And I said, I don't think I've seen that. And I'm trying to remember if I even heard of it. I immediately watched it. And for the next hour and 40 minutes, I was in heaven. Fandango is a road trip movie about four college students who go on this road trip. Get it? I was on a road trip. That's why the movie was suggested to me. It's a perfect movie. It's emotional. It is serious. It's got serious themes about life and decisions that we make. Sam Robards is in it as well. Susie Amos is in it. You may know Susie Amos. Oh, no, Coke, I missed it. Help me. Susie Amos, is there a chance that she was in Titanic and is now married to James Cameron? Is there a chance? Because that's my recollection of Susie Amos. There's also Kevin Costner as a young person, right? He was a kid in 1985. This is 35 years ago. The strange part about this movie is that it was a Steven Spielberg movie, an Amblin Entertainment movie, and Steven Spielberg hated the movie so much, even though he's the one, he is the one who financed this short story to become a long-form feature. He didn't like the final product so much that he did not promote it. He took his name off it, and no one saw it. It was the biggest bomb ever. I would like you to go watch Fandango. And think about what it is as you segue from college into the real world, as you segue on one final road trip, as you think about why Kevin Reynolds would write and direct a movie like this. And it was his first movie. He's done a bunch of movies since then. He did a bunch of stuff with Kevin Costner, some great, some not so great. I think he may have done H2O Globe. But I can only say this. 
I had tears streaming down my face during Fandango. I was smiling the entire time. And the little nugget that I will mention to you is that the huge guy who's in Fandango, I don't want to say more, but the huge guy had never acted before and was found by Kevin Reynolds at a 7-Eleven where he was going in to get a Slurpee. So for all of you who think that you have to go to acting school and think you'll never be discovered and you'll never get a part, that's how this huge man got into Fandango. I hope you watch it, even if you haven't taken a road trip recently. I hope you take the time to listen and pay attention to the fact that life is short and it's full of it's full of issues that come up with health. It's full of issues that come up with your happiness. It's full of issues that come up with your family. It's full of things that you cannot control. But the truth is there are certain things you can control that most people just choose not to. Most people just say no when they should be saying maybe or when they should be saying yes. Most people say I'm not going to do something because I've never done it before. Most people say I'm not going to do something because it's not what other people do. Most people say I'm not going to do something because what will people think of me if I choose to do what you're asking me to do? Maybe that's not the way to be all the time. Okay. Kevin Reynolds. Sorry, that's the names on the document. We're not talking about Kevin Reynolds. We're talking about Nick Castellanos. Okay, Nick Castellanos is a player for the Reds, the player we got the wait to see wrong. Do you recall that? Remember, he got suspended two games, and I thought that it would happen for one game for taunting and starting a benches clearing brawl. He plays for the Reds. And Nick Castellanos is so angry with baseball because of that suspension. Everybody on CBS Sports HQ, everybody on Twitter, everybody everywhere said, this is ridiculous. We're the no fun league. Rob Manford's got to be better than that. And I said, he should have been suspended, but I thought it would be cut to one game because you don't want to incite any sort of riot during COVID. Even after vaccines, you just, it's, you don't want to do it. So something happened that got me into a bit of a disagreement with several people on Twitter. And I want to tell you about that disagreement and tell you why I disagree with the disagreement. And I disagree with you disagreeing with the fact that I disagree with what you don't agree with. Nick Castellanos hit a big home run in the game this weekend. I don't remember whether it was a walk-off, a tying home run. I think it was a walk-off, but I can't remember. And the Reds are playing fine. They're a middle-of-the-road team, whatever. Doesn't matter. Part of the rule when you sign a local broadcasting deal, part of the contract, in addition to money that they pay you, which is a rights fee, what you have to deliver to them are 150 games, so you've got to play 150 games in order to get the rights fee that you've negotiated. You also have to deliver pre and post game media availability to the network. Do you ever wonder why players get interviewed post game? Do you think it's because players like putting the headset on and like talking to the media or to the broadcasters after a game? No, it's part of every broadcast deal, national broadcast deal and local broadcast deal that there will be a post game interview, which is why if you watch very closely after games, there is someone not in uniform. They're in a suit. They're in a they button down shirt or they're in a polo shirt and they're scurrying around looking for the star of the game to get interviewed. Sometimes the star of the game says, piss off, mate. And then you've got to go get someone else because you've got to get somebody. And a little known nugget here is when the star of the game refuses to do the post game interview, and then they've got to get someone to do the interview who's not the star of the game. That guy goes back into the clubhouse, says to the star of the game, dude, I didn't want to do that. That was your job. You hit the walk off home run. You do it. A lot of conversations happen in clubhouses after games about who stayed to do the post game interview. The Marlins used to have a funny way when there'd be a walk-off win, we'd have fun with the post-game interviews for Fox Sports Florida. We would, there'd be pies that would be thrown in faces or water balloons. D. Gordon used to dunk basketballs, which made me crazy. I thought he'd hurt himself. Chris Coglin actually did hurt himself during a post-game interview by jumping on someone who was doing the interview. Whatever the case is, that's how post-game interviews happen, but it's with the player. So Nick Castellanos agrees to do the post-game interview after the Reds game, but then the strangest thing happened. 
Nick Castellanos, you get the headsets, right? It's not anyone standing there with the, with the microphone in your face. You know, it's COVID time. It used to be like that, but now you get headsets and you're talking directly to someone who's not standing near you. So you put the headsets on, you give the interview, then you go back to the clubhouse, eat, shower, leave, good, moving on to the next day. You've done your job. Great. Nick Castellanos gives the headsets to a fan. I've never seen that in my life. I thought that was unbelievably awesome. A fan was going to do the post-game media availability. Nowhere in any broadcast contract I've ever signed, it just says there's got to be media availability. It doesn't say it has to be the walk-off player, the star player. It doesn't say it has to be a player. It could be a coach. It could be a manager. It could be a front office guy. Oh, my God. It could be the hawker. The guy selling hot dogs up and down the aisle. So the fan puts on the headsets. The host has no idea what's going on. And the host says, I remind you, we are on live TV. This fan happened to get a fist bump from Nick Castellanos after he hit the home run. So that was cool. Maybe that's why they wanted the fan on. But then we discovered why. The fan told the story of what he had yelled to Nick Castellanos before he hit the home run. And he said, hey, Nick. Imagine Rob Manford's face on the ball and then hit the crap out of it. Because Nick Castellanos doesn't like Rob Manford because Rob Manford suspended him for two games for what should have been zero in his mind. Nick Castellanos takes the next pitch. Boom. Home run. Nick Castellanos gives the guy a fist bump on the way back into the dugout. The fan gets interviewed and tells this story on television. Yes, this is live. And I found it to be wrong. And I got accused of being a curmudgeon. I'd like to tell you where my head was and why I was upset that this fan was allowed to be interviewed. Why I was upset that this fan said what he said about Rob Manford. Not because I have a personal relationship with him. Not because I helped him get elected. Not because I'm a pro-management guy not because I'm a pro commissioner's office guy, not because I'm an anti-player guy. Do you know what I am? I'm a pro baseball guy. I don't want a work stoppage after 2021 season when the collective bargaining agreement runs out. I don't want any more fighting. You all may think that I love the fighting between the players and the management because it's great content for the show. We have so much content that Coke and I have to spend spend minutes every day cutting crap out. No, we're not going to talk about that. No, not that. No, we could do that. No, that doesn't. That's not going to make the show. Then we put the show together. And then, by the way, not everything that's in the show makes it to you because I end up going too long on several topics. And then Coca during the show is cutting stuff out in my ear. No, no, we're not talking about that anymore. We don't have time. I got you, Coca. I don't want any news to be made that shows any more of the Grand Canyon-like divide that currently exists between the commissioner and the players, the owners and the players, the commissioner and the owners, the players and the players. I don't want there to be any divides between any factions on any side of the agreement, including internal factions, same side factions, because that will lead to more service for you, the fan. And me, the fan, service is a word, more aggravation. More talk. More bullcrap of millionaires and billionaires and what you talk about that you hate. But then at the same time, you're loving the fact because you think Rob Manfred is a terrible commissioner who's screwing with the game. He's making all these rules. He's moving the mound back. He's fighting with players. He's doing pitch clocks. He's doing minimum batter rules. I've got a newsflash, folks. Rob Manford's not doing any of that. Owners are doing that, and players are agreeing to it. Why? Because regardless of what you think, numbers in baseball are down. Attendance is down. Network deals are up. They just signed a new network deal with ESPN, so that should be enough, right? It's not. Youth participation. Not excelling. Time of games. Not getting shorter. 
action in games, not getting better. Offense in baseball, not getting better. So all of the things that you're complaining about that Rob is changing, all of those things, he's doing with owners and players trying to make the game better because you're going to look back at it and say, oh, I don't remember. Do you remember before there was a DH? Before there were wild card teams? When Bud Seeley did wild card teams, you all said the sun will stop rising. It didn't. And now you love it. It's like when the NBA is going to do the play-in tournament, you're all a play-in tournament, play-in tournament. LeBron said he doesn't like it. We can't like the play-in tournament. We don't want any part of the play-in tournament. Uh, okay, you sure? Do you realize that's all anybody's talking about now is the play-in tournament? It's the most exciting part of basketball. Heading into the playoffs, quick, right now, who's the number three versus six seed in the East? Who's playing three, six? Hurry up. Do you got it? Do you got it up there? In Milwaukee, you ready? You got it down here in South Florida? Or do you know Wednesday at 10 o'clock, the Lakers play the Warriors and the loser of that game, the winner of that game's in the playoffs and the loser has to win the next game in order to make the playoffs. How many of you realize that LeBron James and the Lakers, the defending champions, are not currently in the playoffs? How many of you know that the Washington Wizards have a chance to get into the playoffs because they're in the playing games? I think a lot of you do, don't you? What an exciting end of season. That way to see is a slam dunk when I said the play-in tournaments are here to stay, no matter what LeBron said. It's exciting. There's more teams involved. There's more moving around for positioning. Who's going to play who? I remind you, in basketball, there are still 20 teams alive. 10 teams in the East, 10 teams in the West. The first six teams are set. Three plays six, four places plays five, one plays eight. They don't know who they're playing. Two plays seven. They don't know who they're playing. Seven, eight, nine, ten play a playoff tournament. Seven plays eight. That's Lakers Warriors. Nine plays ten. That's San Antonio Spurs against Memphis Grizzlies. The winner of the San Antonio Memphis game has to win again, but they play the loser of the Lakers Warriors game. For the Lakers and Warriors, who are the current seven and eight seed to make the playoffs, they only have to win one out of two games. If they win the first game, they're in. If they lose the first game, they have to win the second game. The nine and 10 seed, which is new because in basketball, it used to be the top eight seeds make it. But now the nine and 10 seed have a chance. And the way they have a chance is they have to win two in a row. But we got the Lakers and Warriors, Steph Curry, who just won a scoring title. Michael Jordan won a scoring title, scoring 28 points a game at 35. Steph Curry just averaged, I want to say, 30 points a game this year. And he needed three points to beat Bradley Beal for the scoring title. And he got it in like the first quarter. And the Warriors are a team without Klay Thompson. He's been hurt without Kevin Durant. And guess what? They've got a chance to make the playoffs. After they were one of the worst teams last year when Curry was hurt, he played five games when he broke his, I don't know what he broke, maybe his wrist. Do you know? that Steph Curry is in a group with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I just read this this morning at 4 a.m., Coca. I think he's in a group with Kareem, you're never going to find this, and Wilt Chamberlain with multiple MVPs, multiple scoring titles, and multiple something else's. There's only three players. We're talking about one of the great players of all time, Steph Curry, of all time. And they get to play the Lakers Wednesday at 10 in a play-in game. The good news is that if they lose, they can try again. Oh, it's Jordan, Chamberlain, and Kareem. Thank you. Michael Jordan, Will Chamberlain, and Kareem are the only players in NBA history with multiple scoring titles, multiple MVPs, and multiple championships. Now Steph Curry has joined that group. I mean, that is pretty cool. You're looking at one of the greatest of all time. So I'm going to be watching the playing tournament starts Tuesday. We're going to do picks for that, of course. It's such good business for basketball. So the way I want you to look at these playing games and the way I want you to look at what happens if the Lakers don't make the playoffs, that's when it becomes bad business because they need the Lakers in the playoffs. But the Warriors would be just as good because of Steph Curry. So they're fine. The winner of Lakers Warriors were good. In their mind, they like them both. Eastern Conference, not as big a deal. 
But when they sit down and they're negotiating with players and baseball is going to be doing this too with expanded playoffs, you just wait for it. It's definitely going to happen. The more markets that are involved at the end, the better. The more tweets that you can see from teams saying we're in like the Wizards, even though they're not, the better it is. Do you know why? Because of business. This is nothing personal.